giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. Uh, we're going to start moving into some of the questions that you guys, the community, submitted. Um, you know, over the last couple of days. Um, we're going to try to move through these probably a little bit quicker so we can try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, so we're going to move on to our first submitted question. Uh, it's kind of a combination of a few submissions that we had from people, uh, including Alex from Team 48. Uh, I think it's Bombay and Chris. Uh, and they all kind of asked about your drive team and kind of all the dynamics that surround that as far as how do you choose who's going to be your drivers and, and human player uh, and I guess technician now. Uh, and kind of how your team operates during the match and how you go about working with your Lions partners, you know, for prepping for a match and then during the match as well. Great question. I'll answer that because our team handbook has actually allowed uh, me as the drive coach to make that selection. And I make that selection based off interviews that I do before our off season starts. So I, we picked our drive team back in late August before Chessie champs. Um, and so we have our drive team set for the 2019 season right now. I, I know a lot of teams will do like uh, driver tryouts with their 2019 robot, but frankly, we don't want to waste that time on driver, driver tryouts that we want to spend training up our drivers that we've identified. And from a personal uh, opinion perspective, I firmly believe that uh, team dedication and the right characteristics of the individual are way more important than some innate driver ability that they might have when they approach the sticks. So we select our drivers in the fall, well before the build season starts, and we stick with that drive team uh, for the entire season. Uh, preparing for matches, like I mentioned earlier, we have a lead, we have a student who serves as our lead strategist, and they are the student that is uh, communicating with our alliance partners before each match and preparing the strategy that student after they've um, negotiated and developed a strategy that everyone is happy with on the alliance they will communicate that strategy with me and then i will have that strategy usually it's on a whiteboard i will take that strategy and then uh, execute on that strategy with our drive team and our alliance partners drive teams awesome all right we're going to move on our next submitted question comes from chris on 4915 and revolves around some of the manufacturing practices uh, that you guys use, specifically how you guys have started to focus more on utilizing uh, you know, CAM software for things like routers and uh, 3D printers, things like that. And so can you guys talk about how you get the most out of these resources and how they make your team's manufacturing processes more efficient? Shoot. So I'm going to have to answer this one again because Katie <laughs> and Jishu are not on the, on the hardware side of things. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say for starters that 1678 has had a very slow lead in to uh, cam and 3D printing and stuff like that, because up until recently, we haven't really relied too much on CAD. And um, the only reason we've been able to rely more on CAD recently is because we have a very robust and evolved uh, computer aid design process. But in the past, our, the robots were kind of half CADed and half just made by hand, and we just dealt with it. Uh, now that we've built up a resource library of multiple CNC routers, and uh, we have 10 3D printers now, we have eight Prusa MK3s and two MarkForge printers that we use extensively in the season. And then we have a team of, I think now 12 uh, CAD students, uh, six of which are, I would classify as major contributors to the CAD. Um, so now that we have that sort of manpower, we're able to uh, do things like rely on CAD and CAM more often. But up until recently, we we're making most of our parts by hand and with manual lathes, manual mills. And that was just because of the resources we had and the knowledge base we had. So I think for 95% of teams, that's still the sweet spot to be in. But for us at this point, um, we're able to rely a little bit more on that because we have a little bit more of uh, institutional knowledge about how to use those machines. But I would say CNC routers and uh, 3D printers are the two main machines that we're using. All right, awesome. Uh, the next question was submitted, uh, I think this is right, Jahel from Team 5507 and focuses on uh, your team's nonprofit organization, the Davis Robotics Foundation. Um, and you, maybe you guys can just talk about uh, what are some of the benefits your team has found creating a nonprofit organization to support the team and what are some tips and best practices you guys can give for going about doing this? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because there are 
it's, it's a lengthy process and there are countless benefits. I think some of the major ones have been that uh, we are able to apply for a lot of different types of grants. Um, there are a lot of FRC grants out there, but there are also a lot of STEM and education-based grants that have to go through a nonprofit. Um, and having a nonprofit ourselves, the Davis Robotics Foundation, makes it much, much easier to directly apply to those rather than having to go through a third party. Um, it also just in general, um, having our own nonprofit uh, rather than say the school um, makes it easier for sp easier for sponsors uh, to donate and easier for us to have more direct access to the money um, and easier tracking. Uh, and it also allows us to have specific accounts for large outreach programs. Uh, for example, Jishnu was talking a little bit about our Davis Youth Robotics programs earlier. Uh, we have a separate part of our uh, Davis Robotics Foundation that is specifically for raising money that goes straight into the DYR programs. And that money isn't money that we use for our team. That money uh, goes straight back into education and straight into the community. Um, so it makes that, type, that organization um, a lot easier. As for um, creating a nonprofit, it's pretty complicated. Um, we actually follow, we pretty much bought a book and followed all of the steps in the book that detailed, you know, very, very meticulously um, exactly how you should set up a, you should set up a nonprofit in California. Um, this book, this specific book series, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it does have books, I think, for every state because each state has slightly different nonprofit laws. Uh, if you want to shoot me an email or if anybody who's interested in this wants to shoot me an email at uh, business at citruscircuits.org, um, I can give you some more specific information on that. Awesome. How long ago did you guys start your nonprofit? Just real quick. Uh, two years. I think it was 2016 okay. off season. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, if anybody has more information or has more follow-ups on that, uh, definitely just hit up that email and uh, it sounds like they can kind of walk you guys through more detailed stuff. Uh, so we're going to move on. Our next question comes from Joe and he asks, what does the discussion and process look like when your team decides to abandon a system that's already working better than 95% of robots to pursue something you anticipate will work better than 99% of robots? So, you know, if you already, so, you know, I, I guess like he's probably, my guess is he had something in mind kind of like, you know, you guys went through a series of intakes last year, right? So, yeah. um, you know, that's a great example probably. Uh, so the students know this, but, you know, I, I, I make it really clear that on the team, we're really focused on winning the world championship. And um, I think they're, uh, all of our students are on this team because they're excited about being a part of a program that's aimed at doing just that. And uh, there, there, that is a loaded question though, because something that works as good as 95% of robots can win you a world championship because it's not just the robot that you build and how well the mechanism's working, but it's how you've in integrated it into your team. So I think anyone who, who looks at 1678 and tries to compare us with the 254s and the 148s and the 118s of the world recognizes that, man, we have pretty crummy robots. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that makes our team so unique is we don't just build a robot, we build a whole team. And we have a group of students that are excited about every element that makes the team competitive. So we do make uh, that decision sometimes to scrap a mechanism to, to try to get it to be better than 99% of teams rather than 95% of the teams. But sometimes like in particular, our drivetrain, our drivetrain is probably like a 75th percentile drivetrain. It's not anything fantastic. We don't really care about JVN's calculator when it comes to our drivetrain. We just build the same thing every year and we call it good. Um, and it's because a, a good drivetrain doesn't make a good team. Um, and so our, our team is really about optimizing every element rather than focusing on a couple of uh, high profile things. And so I, I'd say that's probably what dictates whether or not we make the change is, is this worth the time we're gonna spend if we could spend the time in another area of our team that's actually gonna get us to a world championship level or not. 
Okay, definitely. Uh, the next question comes from Mr. Noble from Chief Delphi uh, from 1339. And he would like to ask, uh, this is kind of back to scouting a little bit. How does your team evaluate the growth of teams uh, when it comes to scouting? He said, sometimes it seems like the Alliance selection is more about past reputation than current capabilities. And he's curious to hear how you guys view and approach this. So what are you guys, what are your guys thoughts on that? Oh man. Um, <laughs> I should probably answer this question as well. I know I, I want Jishin to answer, but I feel like I should answer. Um, so <laughs> he, he can always <laughs> tack on after he can always tack on afterwards. Um, so I'd say that our pick list is um, very much uh, dependent on that event's performance. And so we, we do do some pre-scouting um, for championships, but that's really only to get ready for our qualification matches. Almost all of our pick list uh, priority is based on performance at that event. Um, so I would say um, things that maybe don't come across in the data, but do make an impact with pick list isn't just performance on the field. It's how, what is it like to work with that team off the field? Um, a lot of things that, um, that make a team successful in the playoff rounds uh, aren't just how the robot performs on the field. It comes down to how well is their pit formulated and organized? Do they have a really strong pit lead that has a disciplined approach to getting ready for matches? Um, these are things that are off of the field, but do make an impact when it comes to performing in a playoff scenario. So, uh, you know, and, and a lot of the teams that have been good for a long time have a really good formula when it comes to some of these things that are off of the field. So I would say that while it may look like it's just past reputation, a lot of times it's just because of the impression those teams give at the event. And if teams have a really breakout performance with a robot. However, if they don't have the backbone of their team to back that robot up, a lot of times that can move them down in our rankings just because they don't have the infrastructure to support a good robot going into the playoff rounds. And a lot of times that infrastructure can make or break, make, make or break your playoff run. I'm pretty sure he hit everything. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we're, then we'll move on to our last submitted question uh, before we kind of get into the chat. Uh, Britain from 4488 Shockwave would like to know how your team manages integration between systems, both at a design and mechanical level, as well as, a, you know, an electronics and software level. Um, kind of how does the, how does personnel working on each system collaborate with the rest of the team and work through all those integration points that are usually kind of the trickiest parts of any successful robot? Yeah, so kind of like what I said earlier is that right after our whole kickoff thing, when we've decided kind of what the robot's going to look like and sub-team break-off and uh, designs and hardware starts prototyping and programming starts getting their code together, we do work very closely because we don't want to be in a situation where we've designed something that's close to impossible to program or programmers have written code for a robot that's not going to get built or electricals using a sensor that doesn't really work. So we try to be consistent with our sensors every year. And um, as to the way uh, the mechanism is going to look, we work together with uh, programming works together with design a lot for the first few weeks until we have an idea of what the mechanism is going to look like and how it's going to behave so that our code does what design has in mind for the mechanism to do. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers, keeping fun loud, live and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.